Uh, Center for Neighborhoods is a nonprofit organization here in Louisville, founded in 1972. Uh, it was originally started as the Louisville Community Design Center, uh, which was an organization meant to uh, provide architectural design services to underserved neighborhoods. Uh, after about 25 years or so, they realized um, that buildings are great, but the people that live in the buildings are probably a little more important, and we shifted the focus uh, of what we did uh, to more of a service to residents and resident-led organizations. Um, again, we've been around since 1972. Our mission uh, is building healthy, sustainable, safe, and attractive neighborhoods through engaged, informed, and committed neighbors. Uh, so we do that through a variety of ways. Uh, we do neighborhood plans. We offer technical assistance to resident-led organizations. Uh, we do a lot of data work. Uh, but our biggest, pro probably our biggest program, and what I do, uh, is our education programs. Uh, the biggest of which is the Neighborhood Institute, which is celebrating its 30th anniversary this year. Uh, I'm very, very grateful to my predecessors uh, for having the foresight to create this program. Uh, here are some classes uh, in the past. I think the one on the right is actually the very first class from 1987. Uh, and pays special attention to the black and white image uh, in the left-hand corner, because we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, so that's how I got involved with Center for Neighborhoods and Neighborhood Institute, because I started out as a student. And the thing that really moved me uh, about Neighborhood Institute was watching people understand that they were able to create change in their neighborhood. Because if you haven't really had that experience and you don't have the skills or the resources to do that, that may seem like a really foreign concept and a really impossible thing for you to do, but um, it's possible. <laughs> and we're going to talk about that. Uh, a little bit. So we have some guiding principles in the framework that we base Neighborhood Institute around. And most importantly uh, is the residents know what is best for their community. And when I say that, uh, what I really mean is we let the residents decide what they want in their community. We don't really go into uh, a neighborhood association or a neighborhood that we're working with and say, you know what you guys need to do, you should do this, because that's not our role. It's not our neighborhood, we don't live there, so uh, we, can't, we can't determine uh, the path for other people. So we're very, very intent uh, on letting neighborhoods self-determine their future. Um, a very huge recent thing that was in the news in the last couple years, you may remember the biodigester that was proposed in the West End. So that is a great example of residents getting together uh, and really determining their future, standing up for themselves, organizing, and letting the powers that be know that this is our vision for our neighborhood in the future. So that's really important to us at Neighborhood Institute. Another guiding principle is that people are a community's greatest resource. So it's great if you have a huge organization that can fundraise and you can have concentrated money to try and create change in neighborhoods, but it's not possible without people. Um, people are really the greatest resource and we think that everyone has a gift and everyone has things that they can share in the community. Um, you may have a passion for something, you may have a passion for making sure that there are activities for kids in the neighborhood, or you may have a passion uh, for making sure that the streets are safe or public safety. Uh, and how much training you have may not really totally come into play if you have the passion to work towards that. And those are gifts that everyone has to share, and everyone in every neighborhood uh, has gifts like that to share. So our role with Neighborhood Institute and Center for Neighborhoods is we hone and leverage existing strengths in neighborhoods. So we take your passions, your skills that you already have, uh, and we figure out ways to help you use those in the community to improve the quality of life for you and your neighbors. So we do that by helping community members identify opportunities. So one thing 
that we do in Neighborhood Institute. The curriculum involves a self-directed project in the neighborhood. And we've had over 30 years, we've had hundreds of projects, some you've seen, some have been behind the scenes that you probably never heard of and would never know uh, that it exists, uh, but they are out there and we're gonna talk about some projects uh, later on. Uh, but we ask people to identify what their community needs more of. What, what can you create, what can you change in your neighborhood to improve the quality of life for you and your neighbors? We help community members build skills. So I said that everybody comes in with a certain set of skills, but there are other skills that may help you um, get the change that you want in your neighborhood. So not everybody likes public speaking, so we help people. Uh, we help people learn communication styles. So the sort of communication I'm doing right now is not necessarily what I would do in a private meeting or if I was meeting with a government official. So we help people tailor their message to the audience uh, that they are addressing. We also help people learn how to navigate uh, local government because uh, if you're gonna create change in the community, the government's gonna be a part of it at some point, uh, whether you like it or not. Uh, and we connect community members with resources. So we uh, introduce government agencies, nonprofit partners uh, who can help create the change because you can't really do this stuff by yourself. It takes a team of people. If one person, there's a saying, you know, I can do a lot of things, but I can't do everything. Uh, so really, any sort of long-term neighborhood change takes more than a single actor. Uh, so we connect community members with resources, and remember the biggest resource in the community is people, so we try and connect people with other people as well. When we do that, we step back, because we uh, take an advisory role, but not a leadership role, because as, as I said earlier, uh, we want residents to self-determine the future of their neighborhoods. Um, and the first rule of community organizing is you don't do for people what they can do themselves. So we like to give people the skills and access to resources to create that change for themselves in their neighborhoods. So I wanna talk about some awesome projects that have come out of Neighborhood Institute. So uh, there've been some that are more formal uh, organizations that you would think of like a neighborhood association. Here are a couple, the Lucky Horseshoe Neighborhood Association. Lucky Horseshoe is a subdivision over by Churchill Downs. So uh, Churchill Downs is really famous about one week of the year and the rest of the year the neighborhood kind of gets swallowed uh, in sort of a massive industry and business uh, that nobody really seems to pay attention to them. So they realized that they needed to organize uh, to have a collective voice to interact with the government, interact with nonprofit partner agencies to improve quality of life for themselves and their neighbors. Uh, this is a very grassroots organization. And when I say grassroots, uh, they had the meetings in their living room. One thing that uh, I thought was really clever, they gave Mayor Fisher an award to get him to come to one of their meetings. And the meeting was in the living room. So uh, it doesn't really get much more grassroots than that. Uh, the Breckenridge Estates Neighborhood Association. Breckenridge Estates is a neighborhood uh, in the east, eastern part of the city, right inside the Waterson, well, it's actually right outside the Waterson Expressway. They had trouble accessing uh, city services once the Jefferson County and Louisville, Metro Gov or Louisville government merged. Um, so they got together, formed a collective voice, uh, were able to contract out for services that they were previously receiving from many uh, different vendors. Uh, my favorite Breckenridge Estates story is for their garbage contract, they have to provide their own trash pickup. Uh, the person that was in charge of getting the contract was the vice president. She called, the first company that she called said, oh, I can't talk to you. Can you have your husband call me back? So the first thing she did was call their two biggest competitors set up a meeting with all three of them with overlapping five minutes uh, of time so they had to pass each other in the hallway. Uh, so you can, you can imagine who did not get the contract for that. So the Parkland Community Garden. Uh, the Parkland Community Garden 
uh, was a neighborhood institute project uh, funded by Councilwoman Attica Scott, who's now a state representative. Uh, this took a vacant lot that was, um, you know, it was just a vacant lot and it made a place where people can meet each other, people can get together, so it created a sense of community uh, and, an, and an informal gathering place in a neighborhood where there wasn't one. And Russell walks, there I am with uh, my friends Jackie Evanique, uh, and Julia and Evanique's mom. So Russell walks was a project out of the Neighborhood Institute. Uh, it's a, it's a multi-purpose project. So the walking part is, you know, an access to sort of healthy activities, but Russell in West Louisville is also a neighborhood that some people um, may be a little afraid to walk around in, even the residents. So the idea is to get eyes on the street and have large groups of people walking together, showing that they love their neighborhood, uh, and you can come join us and we'll all be a group together here in the neighborhood. Um, that's a great project, I'm really proud of them. The Morton Avenue Dog Park, I'm sure many of you have seen this. So. Uh, this was a project from some Neighborhood Institute students in about 2006, I believe. Every time I tell people about this, they're like, oh, I know the people that run the dog park. That's not who runs the dog park. That's the beauty of projects like this because they don't run the dog park anymore because they don't have to do it for the rest of their lives. They set up a framework for other people to take it over in the future, and that is a key element to a long-lasting community project. So while the dog park is not a formal organization, it's an informal place where people can get together to meet their neighbors uh, and it provides, it fills a need in the community. So if you live in the Highlands and you live in an apartment and you have a dog, you don't have anywhere for your dog to run. So uh, it, it, it hits many birds with one stone, uh, the Morton Avenue Dog Park, and I just like the baby petting the dog, that's just a great image there. Uh, so I also want to tell you about some great leaders that we've worked with uh, throughout the years. Mike O'Leary, that's Mike O'Leary on the left. Uh, that's also him in the green shirt uh, getting a proclamation from Mayor Fisher. So Mike uh, lives in the Clifton neighborhood. Mike is the founder of the Billy Goat Hill Cliff, uh, Community Garden, which is on Payne Street. You've probably either driven past it or ridden the bus past it, maybe ridden your bike past it. Uh, here's an interesting thing about Mike founding the garden. Mike is not a gardener. Mike hates gardening. But across the street from his house, there was a large piece of vacant land uh, that he thought other people might be interested in uh, utilizing as a community garden. So he got together with some other neighbors and you know, he just really did the management part and set up a garden, had property rights agreements with the people that actually owned the property. Uh, because he saw a need in the community and put the community needs before his own interests. So we love Mike and uh, Mike actually serves on our board of directors now after attending Neighborhood Institute. So this was his Neighborhood Institute project, the Billy Goat Hill Community Garden. Uh, my favorite thing that Mike says that I share all the time, people who show up to the meetings are the ones who help make the decisions. So. Uh, I know everyone's busy, but if you see a public meeting about an issue that you're interested in, somebody's going to be there. It might be you, it might not be you, but the people that are there are the ones whose voices are going to get heard. So keep that in mind. So here's my friend Chip Rogolinski. Chip uh, was the president of the Shelby Park Neighborhood Association. Uh, my favorite thing about Shelby Park, uh, the Shelby Park Neighborhood Association, is they are without a doubt the most inclusive organization that I've ever worked with. Uh, and because they are so inclusive, uh, it really eliminates a lot of conflicts that you will see uh, in organizations like this. Chip uh, has spent years and years trying to just improve the outward image of the Shelby Park neighborhood uh, because he loves the people there, he loves the houses there. He loves everything about the neighborhood and he will tell you about it for hours and hours and hours. Uh, but Chip, actually that's, that picture is uh, one they used when Chip got a national award for his work in neighborhoods. Uh, and part of his acceptance speech, uh, talking about his neighbors, so uh, the way I see it, they are all my neighbors. I want them, all to, I want them to stay and be contributors to our success. So Chip loves all of his neighbors. 
he realizes that everyone in the neighborhood has a gift and has something to contribute uh, to the neighborhood. So you remember at the beginning I said, pay attention to this black and white image in the left-hand corner. So there's my friend Lucille Leggett. That's Lucille right there. This is a Neighborhood Institute class from I'm not sure what year. So it was way before my time. I'm thinking it was the late 1980s. Uh, Lucille is again in Neighborhood Institute and she was in our class last night. Uh, she's, she's still around. There's Lucille with Mayor Fisher last week. So uh, Lucille still plans projects in the Russell neighborhood. So if you're uh, in Russell next Sunday or next Saturday morning uh, and you see a bunch of people cleaning up, a tra it's cleaning up trash for the neighborhood cleanup, you'll see Lucille. She'll be out there. She'll probably t be telling people what to do and not doing a whole lot of trash picking up. But, uh, and actually the image on the right is for a neighborhood institute we did specifically for residents in Russell. So Lucille's been a great community asset for many, many years, uh, and we're, we're lucky to have her involved with our organization. So if any of this has inspired you, I want to uh, leave you with two thoughts. So what we really do with Neighborhood Institute is we empower residents to let them know that they can make a difference. Uh, the first time I realized that was the first time I met my, council, my Metro Council person said, I have a problem in my neighborhood and I don't w know what to do. And we worked together to fix that and it changed my life. Um, so going forward, if you want to be involved in your community in the way that we are involved in communities, I want you to think about these three things. So what is one thing you're passionate about in your neighborhood that you would like to improve uh, to change the quality of life for you and your neighbors? Again, it could be youth programming. It could be what do I do with this vacant lot at the end of my street? Uh, how do I keep the neighborhood clean? What do I do about traffic issues? Uh, what can you commit to being a part of the process to create that change? So can you commit time? Can you commit um, your skills? Can you commit to asking five people to come help you? And what do you need outside of yourself to create that change? Because again, everybody can't do everything. You can do a lot of things. Uh, but you can find other people that can make up those deficiencies and you can always call Center for Neighborhoods because we are here to help and thank you very much.